What's going on, everyone? And welcome into this edition of Be Shave Daily Live, recorded here on YouTube after the Cardinals took down the Phillies three to nothing this evening at Bush Stadium. Appreciate you guys who are joining me live. If you want to jump into the live chat, you can do so fairly easily by just making sure you are subscribed to the YouTube channel. Hit the subscribe button in the lower right hand corner of your screen. And uh, that should allow you to comment. And in fact, I don't even know if I managed to turn on the um, the the requirement to force you to subscribe to comment tonight. So you might be off the hook, but please do subscribe anyway if you enjoy Cardinals content throughout the season. Um, that's what you'll be able to find here on YouTube and on the B-Shape Daily feed as well, the podcast feed on Spotify. Make sure you like this video. Get the likes going on YouTube. We want to see those likes go up. I appreciate the three of you who have done so. So far, I'm going to just dive right into my thoughts from tonight's game. I've got a few talking points here, and then I will make sure to get to as many of your comments as I can. But let's start with Sonny Gray, the obvious from tonight. The Cardinals knew coming in, he was going to be on a truncated pitch count. Just 65 pitches was the prescription for what Sonny Gray was going to be available for tonight for the Cardinals. And man, was he ever efficient. When you think 65 pitches, you might think, okay, there's a pretty good chance he's only going to get through maybe four innings, right? But he was through about 53 pitches, I think, after the first four innings. And there was a conversation with Ollie Marmel where if you heard the postgame comments from Sonny Gray, which we won't play of any of those right here, uh, but maybe later on tomorrow on the YouTube channel, I can post some of that stuff. I just don't know mechanically how to get it going during the recording as we're doing this live on uh, on YouTube. But he said to, to Ollie Marmel, as it was relayed by Sonny Gray, don't let me do anything stupid. Don't let me try to talk you into something here that could compromise me, that could compromise the team. Don't let me do anything stupid here. And Ollie said, well, do you want to, Do you want me to call it right here after four? And he said, well, how many pitches? 53. He said, no, no, let me get a quick one here. So Sonny goes back out there for the fifth. He gives up a couple of weak singles. The second one in particular was just blooped. Nothing you can do about it. And that put him in a bit of a tight spot because at that point he was at 62 pitches. And we know coming in, stupid 65 year. was the was the prescription there. Maybe that's part of what happened. I had the YouTube video itself open up on another screen uh, hopefully turning that off is something that maybe helped it out. But anyway, he talks about 62 pitches. We, you know, what's the spot you're going to come into? Ollie walks up to the mound. They have this mound meeting, and I could just kind of tell the way Ollie came out of the dugout that this was maybe not going to be goodbye necessarily. They did have Zach Thompson warming up behind Gray just in case in the bullpen. But it kind of, I got the sense that this was going to be a, hey, this is your guy, but it's your last guy. Do what you can with it. Maybe an economical couple of outs here. And it was crazy to hear Sony Gray talking about it after the game and saying, I stood there and told the guys, like, here's what we're going to do. We're going to get this guy to ground into a, a ground ball here. We're going to get a double play, and we're going to get out of this inning. That's exactly what Sony Gray was able to do a couple of pitch later, uh, pitches later, rather, getting Johan Rojas to ground into the inning ending 6-4-3. Five innings, five hits allowed, all of them singles off of Sonny Gray, and five strikeouts in the game, including a couple of Bryce Harper, uh, got GT, uh, JT Real Muto a couple of times and uh, thoughts and prayers up to, to Real Muto. That looked like a nasty hit that he took off the wild pitch later on in the game. He had to leave the game. I think it kind of caught him uh, like the undercarriage right below the mask there. I don't know if it was the throat or what the it, it did not look great. And that's a tough guy. For, so for him to come out of the game, certainly a situation that uh, w w was at least moderately concerning uh, for, for, the, for the Philadelphia catcher in that spot. But a really nice job by Sonny Gray to get through this lineup in the way that he did. He was economical. He was efficient, finding his way through this game. Uh, it's the most you possibly could have asked for from Sonny Gray tonight for the St. Louis Cardinals, finding some way to just just gut through an outing after 36 days had gone by since he last pitched in a, in a real baseball game because he didn't really get to have a rehab assignment. These were simulated outings. These were uh, you know live bullpen sessions more so that Sonny Gray was having in the ramp-up process to get back to this moment, to get back to that Bush Stadium mound, which is where he wanted to be all along. And it was interesting to hear him talk about it post-game tonight to say that there's just something about being in that major league environment, being back with the the, the guys in the clubhouse, being in front of the home fans, that kind of gave Sonny Gray the extra gear that he needed tonight to be able to, to just kind of get back into the rhythm of things. And it's like he never even left. He had a great season last year. Cardinals signed him off of that Cy Young caliber season as he was a, a a near top finisher for that award in the American League. And we saw the reasons why tonight from Sonny Gray. Really impressive five innings. Knowing that you go in with a pitch count 
and the other team knows you're going in with a pitch count. And so they can try and do some things to, to grind you and to work you a little bit harder so that they can get you out of the game a little earlier. And to have all of those facts at the table out front for everybody to be aware of pregame and to still be able to qualify for the win tonight, Sonny Gray was absolutely splendid. And it, and it was so interesting. You can go inning by inning and look in the second where he comes up with the double play or the, the spot where you had Trey Turner that gets on base with the infield hit. Just a little bit of a delay on, on the throw by, by Mason Wynn, who has played phenomenal shortstop defense so far for the Cardinals. Uh, that was just a spot where they were just a touch late on the transfer and being able to get that throw to first. And so now you're dealing with a base runner who you know has a lot of speed. Yvonne Herrera, it's been a little bit of a hiccup in his game so far that he's not been able to throw out any base runners. I think they're either 6-for-6 six six or 7-for-7 seven seven against him on stolen base attempts. And with Trey Turner on first base and a pitcher that is obviously trying to be economical with his pitches, I think that was an inherent opportunity for Turner to go ahead and turn on the Jets and run. He ends up doing it within that inning. But what does Sonny Gray do? He says, that's fine. He strikes out Bryce Harper before the, the base runner actually goes to second, gets the next strikeout of Real Muto, and then the ground ball to Arenado, who is not hitting. Guys, we know that Arenado is not looking good right now. It was just a lot of weak ground balls to the infield tonight for Nolan Arenado coming on the heels of a game last night where he wasn't able to come through in the 10th inning, had a couple of late strikeouts in that game, and it's disappointing to kind of see where he is right now. It is still just 12 games into the season. That would be kind of my thought process on that understanding that it does not look good. But I will say this for Arenado, defensively, he hasn't allowed the offensive at-bats and the struggles there at the plate to carry over with him to the field because he made some nice plays tonight, and one in particular charging a, a ground ball, a bunt, that uh, that ended up turning into a sacrifice. But that's another runner on second base that was stranded by Sonny Gray. He was able to pitch around very minimal traffic because it was all singles that he gave up. I don't believe he walked anybody in his outing tonight. Uh, was just He was in the strike zone, man. Yeah, no walks. Uh, allowed by Sonny Gray. I want to check the pitch count, the, the strike count, I should say. 43 strikes on 64 pitches. He started out with some some long counts, some full counts there in that first inning, but was able to kind of grind through that moment. And from there, it was just easy, easy going, easy sailing for Sonny Gray and what he was able to do. So some really impressive stuff there by Sonny Gray tonight. Cardinals fans, let me know what you think in the chat below if you're watching live, in the comments below if you're watching this later on YouTube. He was particularly impressive tonight. Everything the Cardinals could have hoped for him to have been. Um, Bryce Harper came into this game kind of struggling for his career against Sonny Gray. That was something that continued tonight as well. Offensively, we'll talk about the offense real quick, and then I want to get to the bullpen before I jump into the comments with you guys tonight here on YouTube. Nolan Gorman carrying the lumber. We talked last night about how the middle of the order, guys number two, three, and four, which is Goldie, Gorman, and Arenado. On Monday, those guys went for a combined two for 15 with seven strikeouts. And none of those moments were more uh, disappointing than in the 10th inning when you had both Nolan strike out to end that game with runners on first and third. But tonight, the big swing by Nolan Gorman, which again, he hit two home runs just the other day as well, and then another one tonight. So uh, he's basically got those season numbers as we talked last night. It, it can only take maybe one or two games to get some of these guys who you might say, ah, they're not performing that well. It doesn't necessarily take them too long to be able to get back and, and have those numbers look pretty good ultimately at the end of the day. So he's able to do that tonight with the home run, and now suddenly the season-long numbers don't look too bad, um, I, I don't believe, for uh, for Nolan Gorman. 753 OPS, you'll take it after the 2-for-4 four four that he had tonight with the home run. Uh, really critical, I thought, in the fifth inning to see the at-bats that you got from the bottom of the order. Alec Burleson gets a knock. Mason Wynn continuing to see the ball well. He has a double, and now suddenly you've got two in scoring position with no outs, and you say, what's the moment going to be for Victor Scott? Are they going to have him bunt? Are they going to have him try something there? Um, no, he ends up swinging away, and I thought maybe trying to get Bryce Harper to field the bunt could have been interesting because maybe you find your way on base uh, and get the run home, but he swings away and gets into a two-strike count, if I'm recalling correctly, was able to get the sacrifice fly to left. I like that the Cardinals sent Alec Burleson from third base. You want to make Brandon Marsh try and make a play there, try and make him make the throw, take take the game to him, and he's not able to make the throw. It, it's way offline, and you score that really important insurance run when you know that you've got your starter that's not going to be able to get beyond the five innings. Um, he did his job at that point, and the Cardinals were able to, on a night again where they, they scored three or fewer runs, I believe it's either the sixth or seventh time that that's happened over the first 12 games this year. But it's interesting to see them be able to come through in the way they did with Brendan Donovan. Then, again, it's nothing flashy, but just finding a way to put the ball in play, a weak grounder to the right side ends up uh, with, with where he placed that ball being an easy way to plate 
the second run in that fifth inning. So there's your runs. Bullpen, go out and do your job. And boy, did they ever. And I think nobody stood out more than what Jojo Romero was able to do for the Cardinals tonight. He records five outs in this game. Um, and, I'll, and I'll get to Libertor and Kittredge's role as well because it was a little bit funky the way that this played out. When you have a guy pitching as well as Sonny Gray is, it means you're you're in the game and you're, you're obviously in a spot where you're leading when he exits the game. But because of his pitch count, he's only going five. Like typically, if you have a guy dealing like that, he's going to go six, seven, maybe eight innings. But in this case, we knew coming in that wasn't going to be the case for Sonny Gray. But they also didn't feel compelled to go to Zach Thompson because now you're in sort of just you're one inning short of just being able to kind of line up your late inning guys, seven, eight, nine, and proceed pretty standardly in a game that you're leading. But because they needed to find a way to navigate that six as well, and then Libertor gets into a little bit of trouble walking a couple guys, huge for him to be able to come up with a double play ball before leaving the game himself. But that allows for Kittredge to come in. He gets an out in the previous inning, and then he comes out and begins the next inning. He gets into a bit of trouble himself, and that's where the, the job that JoJo did. An inning and two-thirds, so he records five outs, four of them via the strikeout, was absolutely sensational tonight for the Cardinals. Got into a little bit of danger himself. He walks the first guy that he faces there when he comes in with a couple of runners on. So now the bases are loaded, but he gets the two strikeouts that he really needed in that spot to be able to get the Cardinals through. Um, man, you just feel really good about the job he's doing. A 1.35 ERA now on the season for JoJo Romero. And I want to check the number of pitches he threw tonight um, because that they asked a lot of him. They asked a lot of... Romero sort of by design with the way that the bullpen was was shaking out after the short start by Gray. I and mean, it's hard to call it a short start because he gave you the absolute maximum uh, of what he was going to be allotted for this game. 34 pitches, 22 strikes by Jojo Romero. He came up really clutch for the Cardinals in this one. And then Helsley. Look, I know some people look at Ryan Helsley's outing from last night and they say, well, he, you know, the Manford man scored and he, he walked Harper and then another run scores because, man, why can't Ryan Helsley be that shutdown guy? we might be watching different games because it's really hard for me to pin that on Ryan Helsley with what happened Monday night where you get the first out in the inning, you walk Harper because of course you do. You want to set up the double play. I understand it's not ideal that that second run ended up scoring. And so now the the runner on second, which is Victor Scott in the 10th inning last night, isn't actually the winning run or the, even the tying run at that point anymore. And so that that ends up putting a little bit more of a pressure spot on your offense and they weren't able to come through. But the, the ball that Alec Bohm hit, it was just a, a, a ground ball over the bag that he chopped into the dirt and it turned into a double that allowed for the Phillies to score and then they put Bryce Harper into scoring position. And so that that unfolds the way that it did last night. I don't look at that and go, Ryan Helsley is a failure. You look at what Ryan Helsley did tonight, 14 pitches, 11 strikes. There are just nights at times where Ryan Helsley comes out and it's just not fair. You just look at that game and you go, oh, it's over. He said nighty night and you're just going to have to deal with it if you're the opposition. That's the Ryan Helsley the Cardinals got tonight. I do like and appreciate that they have come out and said, look, he's going to be a traditional closer. That's going to be the role for Helsley this year because I think it's how you get the most out of him. I think it's how you you find a way to manage his workload where he's not either doing back-to-backs and coming in for multiple innings and coming in. I know that it's maybe disappointing, and there are some throwback fans who like throwback baseball, and they would say the way that we need to go about this is Ryan Helsley's just available all the time because that's what toughness is. I don't think that's smart. I don't think that's an intelligent way to manage a guy. Look at all the injuries happening around baseball. Look at all the elbows that are blowing out across the league for these prominent pitchers, starters, relievers, you name it, that that those teams aren't going to have those guys. I think the Cardinals deserve some credit because they've got Ryan Helsey right now. They've got a plan to manage him. It's going to include some back-to-backs, as you saw tonight, but then he's going to be unavailable on Wednesday and he's going to get that second day of rest on Thursday when the Cardinals are off. And that's going to be the two off days that he needs heading into the the road trip that he's probably going to be back on the horse and ready to go. He's pitched in at least half the game so far this year. I can't remember if he's gone six or seven, but he's been utilized heavily, but I think in a way that's smart and potentially sustainable. Like, I don't think it's sustainable for him to end up with 82 relief appearances this year. It's probably a little too many. But is it sustainable for him to get into the 60s and 65, 70? That's maybe still pushing it a bit. But I think the way the Cardinals are using him and the way that unless he's inheriting these Manfred men, he's actually been pretty efficient as well. I think Ryan Helsley's job goes a little bit unnoticed because you you look at the ERA coming into tonight. No, it's a 4.5 ERA. I don't think that really tells the full story. So I'm impressed as well by by what Helsley did. But I want to mention again the swag. I think JoJo has swag. You look at the way that he ends the inning uh, against uh, Kyle Schwarber there, I believe, was the last strikeout of that particular inning. 
where he he does almost the uh, the Genesis Cabrera spin and flex on him. JoJo is really coming into his own, and so that's been really nice to see from him as well. Um, just some impressive stuff by the Cardinals. And I wanted to mention one other thing before I go ahead and get into these comments, which if you, if you haven't commented yet, feel free to go ahead and do so because I'm about to dive in hot and heavy, fast and furious to those. But make sure you subscribe to this channel by clicking that subscribe button in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. But I'm going to take a sip, and then I'm going to talk about one other kind of unheralded aspect. It's just something that stood out to me tonight. It's not that he you know, was outrageous at the plate, but somebody that I just want to once again reiterate that uh, it's a good thing he's getting opportunities. And uh, that someone is Yvonne Herrera. The, the base hit that he had later on in this game, I think it was just like a, a one for kind of day for him. Let me go back and check. One for four, but he's hitting 296 with an 819 OPS. And just the piece of hitting, he had some good swings that were were just yanked foul and, and could have had a bigger night than he did have offensively with the one for four. But I just want to give the Cardinals a little bit of credit. I liked Andrew Kisner. I thought he was really important for last year's team. But you know what? Last year's team wasn't a winning team. And the Cardinals had had something in mind for what they were going to do and the way they were going to use Yvonne Herrera. And for as much as I was skeptical in the offseason of that decision to let Kiz go, I understood it. But I also said, you know, I think you're letting a pretty good player who is kind of a glue guy walk. But those are sometimes the difficult decisions you have to make as an organization. And I think the Cardinals ultimately, not as a knock on Andrew Kisner, but in in what uh, the positive element of the growth for Yvonne Herrera has been, I think they made a, a very, uh, maybe a difficult, but I think a choice that, that almost needed to be made in order to get the most out of the development of what this young kid could be. He is an absolute major league hitter. I know his teammates have said it, but we're starting to really see it as well. I'm just impressed with Yvonne Herrera offensively. I still think he's got a ways to go behind the plate, in particular in controlling and managing the run game. But that's the, it's kind of like something that they're putting off for the time being. They, they're aware of it, but they're also looking at it and saying, isn't the priority right now the way he's managing games, the way he's handling pitching staff and things like that, kind of do this one step at a time. I think the Cardinals are satisfied with what they're getting from him right now, and, and I think rightfully so uh, with the way that he is performing at the plate in particular and, and being able to handle the pitching staff the way he's done early on. Uh, appreciate you guys for joining me. Make sure to hit like on this video if you are tuning into the live stream. Heck, even if you're not, hit like on the video on YouTube so we can get the likes up on this one. We're not quite to 20, but I bet we can get there here soon. All right, jumping into the comments now, let's go ahead and make it happen. Jack, what's going on? Was doing the broadcast ops for the Mizzou game. Hopefully uh, this synopsis has been um, satisfactory to this point. Cardinal Squad says that Gray looked amazing. He did. He really did. Uh, Michael, welcome in. Brett says, I've been to every home game so far, but I had to work tonight and miss arguably the Cardinals' best played game so far. Yeah, here's what I'll say, guys. If you live in the in the St. Louis area, St. Louis County, St. Louis City, even St. Charles County where I live, you can check out those secondary markets right now. One of them needs to be a sponsor on the podcast. we got to get that going because I would be able to talk it up. It, it was a nice night tonight. There was a little bit of rain, kind of scattered drops, but nothing that impacted the game. Just maybe noticed it driving to and from the stadium. You could be in Bush Stadium tonight and really all this week for for real cheap. Um, I think on some of the secondary sites, it was literally a dollar to get in the building, uh, minus the fees, of course. That's always going to be a part of it. But, but man, I get it. it. It's school night. It's April. It's maybe, you know, you're worried it's going to get a little chilly. A lot going on. Tough to get down there for 645 first pitch, whatever the case might be. But there were a couple of – I was at Bush both nights uh, the last two nights. And even though yesterday's game didn't go the Cardinals' way – and some, I mean, that has been some quality entertainment. And certainly if you got to watch the debut for Sonny Gray tonight, you didn't regret being there. Um, so that's just my take. Felix, what's going on? Appreciate you, man. Uh, SIUE did beat Mizzou tonight in baseball, unfortunately. Um, Aaron says, I need to get Kyle Reese back on here as a live guest. You know what? I have to get StreamYard. I think StreamYard is the way that a lot of the, the podcasts that you guys watch who do live guests um, put that together. I have not gotten my StreamYard account going yet. I know it's something I need to do. Um, I'm kind of in the mode of like, okay, let's make sure we, uh, let's make sure that we get the the technology cooperating when it's just me, and then we'll kind of go from there. But there are certainly a few people out there that I that I would like to talk to, um, doing some live podcasts or even some recorded ones. So that's something to look out for. Dealing the cards pod is one of them. Uh, they say what's up in the chat. Kenneth Jojo is the new Al Herbosky. Yeah, the same facial hair. I mean, you at least have that to go with, so that's good. Uh, but no, he has got that swag. He's got that energy, and I think we kind of noticed it a bit last year, and people were perhaps skeptical of, is that a one-hit wonder? Is he going to be able to maintain that? Jojo has maintained that, man. He is that guy, and I this bullpen is good. Like, I'm just going to say, this this is a different-looking bullpen, and the Cardinals don't even have Keenan Middleton part of it yet. 
but don't you just kind of feel it? I know there are going to be nights where the bullpen doesn't doesn't get it done, and maybe it feels like it costs you a game, right? John Keen gave up a homer the other week. Uh, he's not on the roster now. He was the roster move for Sonny Gray today. Um, it, it's just going to happen at times. A bullpen could have a 2.5 ERA, and that's really good, but what does that mean? It means that every nine innings or so, they give up two or three runs. It's just going to happen. So no bullpen is going to be perfect. But if you look at the way this thing is set up, I think Helsley is one of the top closers in the league. I think as much as Geo is going to give up the, the the stray solo shot here and there, and it's happened a couple times this year already, he's going to be a guy that you can trust in some of those leverage spots, especially if the the his pitches are working and the slider is kind of working off of everything else. He can be nasty. JoJo, you saw it tonight. I think Kittredge has a real viable role for the one he can bring to the table. We saw him pitching multiple innings tonight. Um, Jeff Jones told me it was the first time that he that he believes that's happened um, since he had the surgery a couple of years ago. So you, you've got some dynamic guys, some guys who can fit in, into some different roles. I still feel like there's there's more gas in the tank for for Andre Pallante who can bring something to the table. Uh, Matthew Libertor needed to, to kind of dial in the command a little bit tonight, but he was able to still get a double play that if he doesn't come up, like you could look at multiple relievers and certainly in Sonny's outing tonight, there are multiple moments where if they get something different in the result instead of the double play ball or the big strikeout or whatever it was, if it's a base knock, this game could turn very, very quickly because there wasn't a lot of margin for error with the way that the offense is still kind of feeling their way through it right now. So to be 6-6 six and six where the Cardinals are and to be doing that with an offense that still feels kind of bottom 10-ish, I'd have to go back and look at the OPS and everything, but they're about bottom 10 right now. To be where they are is a credit to what they've done in the rotation, certainly, but the bullpen as well has come up really, really big in some of these games. Felix says, I was at the game. Sonny looked real good. The vibe at the game was a little weird. Players looked so relaxed and low-key. I uh, wish I saw a little more fire in them. Yeah, I don't really mind that. I think it, I think that's just one of those things that, um, you know, you, you don't force a certain uh, aesthetic or a certain vibe to a team. I think they're going to come into their own. I think they know, like the position players, they're playing impeccable defense. We talked about just how much a priority on defense could make a difference for a largely pitch-to-contact pitching staff, and we've seen all offseason the Cardinals talk the talk about prioritizing it, and they are walking the walk in the way that they're setting this up, which is why Victor Scott's not going to go down when Newpark comes up, by the way. That's my prediction. That's not me reporting it, but it's my prediction because when you look at the way that they have handled things, they are at their best when their defense can be strong, not only up the middle, but in general. And by moving Lars Newpark potentially, let's say you're worried about Vic and you're worried about the way that he's not not producing at the plate, and you're hoping that it's a situation, uh, as I think you guys are going to get some ads here, so if you do, bear with me. Um, and if I see everybody drop off, then I'll know. But uh, the situation as it pertains to Victor Scott, if he's not hitting and the Cardinals go, yeah, we don't want to want to mess up his development, we're going to send him down. We're going to you know give him some time in Memphis. We're going to have New Bar play center field. You can do that. But I think what's going to make it for the best – long-term, short-term, and, and just overall arrangement for this pitching staff is to see Newpar in left, is to see Victor Scott or somebody comparable in center field, which you could maybe go Michael Ciani. I just don't know that they're willing to give him that level of playing time at this point. Um, and then tonight we saw Burleson in right, whereas Jordan Walker is typically going to be in right field. He got the night off tonight. Might be a day uh, tomorrow to give Victor Scott off. We'll have, to, we'll have to wait and see. And the guys at the corner, it's two. We'll see what Goldie and Arenado, if that's a, a day game after a night game when you've got potential rain in the forecast, if that's something that they might uh, end up looking at there as well. But I just think because of the priority that is placed, should be placed, and con- continue to be placed on defense for this Cardinals team, that's probably why Victor Scott ought to stay for the time being um, and just being able to fight through what he can do at the plate, which, by the way, the sacrifice fly that he had tonight I thought was a good A-B. It's not like – I know the narrative is that he's overmatched, and there are times where he's not – you know. He's he's at a deficit against the pitching that he's facing. There's no doubt about that. I think that would be true of many young players. But I also don't think it's just been so night and day that he just can't possibly go up there and hold a bat. Like, he's hit into a little bit of bad luck. How different would we be feeling if a couple of those that he was close to beating out on infield hits or a couple of those bunts or, you know, one of those one of those hard contacts just doesn't go right into a glove, how much differently would we be looking at him at this point? Um, I think it's more, th- more on the psyche to have the batting average that he has, but at the same time, I think he's been a valuable player in the way that the Cardinals have constructed their team. It's for defense to really to really shine and to be a big part of, of what they're trying to do. So I, I think right now you're just waiting on the middle order bats to go. If Goldie and Arenado are going – you're not really that worried about Victor Scott's development because he's on a winning team. He's having fun out there. He's captaining that outfield with the defense that he plays in center field. I honestly think that that could kind of be an element of this where 
Um, it's just a little bit more noticeable, the struggles he's having at the plate, uh, at least in the box score, right? And Ollie Marmel has said there's no concern for him. I'm, I have minimal concern. The only time that I was really concerned with Vic was the day a couple days ago that he was just bunting, it seemed like, a little bit too often to where if he felt more comfortable and confident at the plate, would he still be laying it down and trying to maybe force the issue on the bunting more often than others? Um, Jack says, would you ever consider live streaming during a game for live reactions? I would if I thought the juice would be worth the squeeze. If people would watch that, I would need probably multiple people to either comment on YouTube, DM me at bshafer12 on Twitter, to say, look, this is something that I would really like. And obviously, I wouldn't be able to show you the game. That's not legal. But you guys know what I'm watching. I know what you're watching. And we can kind of talk just generally about the Cardinals and, and kind of react to some of the stuff that we're seeing. I think that's something that could be in play. I also really would like to start streaming MLB The Show, where I'm just playing the show in the background, and you guys are asking me Cardinals questions, and I'm just kind of riffing on the Cardinals for a while as I play the video game. I think that could be kind of a more fun, casual way of doing this rather than it all being so kind of buttoned up at times, which I don't I don't try to button it up, but at times I do feel like it's a little more business-oriented um, when I'm trying to get through everybody's comments. But those are things I'd like to do. Again, I'm, I'm not a tech wizard, so I, there are some things i got to work through with that. But I know there's some smart people out there who would also uh, lend a hand to me if I asked, and there's there's been some people who have offered, I'll get you set up for that. i got to get a PS5, though. So we we got to try to get the, um, the, the, the YouTube revenue rolling a little bit, and then I can maybe uh, justify that purchase a little bit down the line. Let me let me take a quick drink and we'll get back into the comments here. Uh, and, and yeah, Jack mentioned one that I'm not working would obviously be the live stream. In the home games, I'm typically there, not always going to be there. Like I said, won't be at Wednesday's game um, with some stuff going on family-wise. But road games, I don't really do a ton of travel since I have the young the young son. And um, that might be sometimes to, to do some live reacts uh, videos if people would be into it. Corey says, just imagine how good this team will be if Goldie and Arenado figure it out at the plate. Luckily, they're playing their old selves defensively. Yes. If that if those two guys were going, even at like a 750 clip on the OPS, and right now they're both about 570, this team would be, I, they're, what are they, 6-6? Six and six. The Cardinals, I mean, they would be probably 8-4 and four at least. I mean, it would be tremendous. And then you would just feel the staying power of, all right, this is a rotation that if it's middle of the pack, with Sonny Gray, it might be even better than middle of the pack. If he's going to be the guy that we saw tonight consistently, the league's going to have to be on notice for what he can bring. And the bullpen, I think, can be, look, I, I've kind of wavered between is it top 12, can it be top 10? I think certainly there's a chance that it can be if if we continue to see the performances uh, that we got certainly or, or that we saw from the Cardinals tonight. Um, that was a, that was an impressive showing where they kind of you you, you got to ride the rail in that spot where you decide hey we're not going to go to Zach Thompson but the guys that we do go to following an extra inning game knowing you've got a, a day game tomorrow that was a heck of a performance by the bullpen I, I I come away very very impressed from the way the pen pitched obviously Gray did his thing and that's the headline but the bullpen is really what allowed for this game um, to be able to happen and as Gray said the defense is what allowed for Gray's game to to be able to go the way that it did um, Brett, thank you on the comment for the audio snips, uh, says I'm looking beautiful, uh, which is, which is always appreciated. Brian says, be safe. What's good, brother. Do you go to every home game or about how many do you get to check out? So I've been to four of the five have covered four of the five so far. Uh, we'll miss tomorrow making it four of the six. I would say that, that, that little two out of every three range is pretty good. Unless we have a family thing going on where I'm out of town for a weekend, that'll happen from time to time. Um, so I would say 50, 55, uh, maybe 60. It'll probably be closer to that 50 range this year um, just because, too, I, I want to make sure that we're taking advantage of uh, the 18-month-old growing up and having a real fun summer. He's at a fun age where we can do some things, and uh, I'm going to I'm gonna live life with no regrets, man. I'm going to do a great job for KMOV and check out my story for them tonight on Sunny Gray's outing, um, and I'm going to try to do the best job I can here for YouTube as well, but um, we're also going to make sure to, to prioritize the things that are important in life and, and, and have no regrets about that. Uh, the family stuff, man. Once you have, once you have a, 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 a kid like I have, um, you may think one thing and then you, you, you have it play out and you're like, yep, this is the way. And I don't have any regrets about it. Um, but I appreciate that question, Brian, for people who maybe don't know. Yeah. I'm, I'm writing stories for KMOV, you know, a handful of stories over the past week with the, with the homestand that's, that's going on. And I'll continue to write from the road. I just won't be at a lot of those road games. I, I've got a Wrigley trip later on this year. That'll make so, you know, I might end up pushing 60-some-odd games depending on on the way the summer unfolds. Um, if they're competitive, I mean, certainly. Planning to go to Birmingham when the when the Cardinals play that real cool game against the Giants later in June. So that'll be fun, too. 
Jared says the pitching was so great today. Personally, love JoJo. How can you not love JoJo? The energy that he brings and the uh, the execution that he brings, right? Like he's performing, and that's the bottom line. He's he's getting the job done. Thirty two likes. I bet we can get it up to forty, and maybe even Bob Gibson's number forty five because we had Sonny Gray wearing the uh, the, the the throwback looking uh, Bob Gibson uh, inspired hat tonight at, at uh, his locker for the post game. Um, that was pretty cool, man. The 45 on the hat, that that was definitely a nice nod to Bob Gibson. Uh, Snip says that Sonny was a breath of fresh air, and Brett says the bullpen's night and day from last year. Yeah, look, I think the bullpen, like, you may be skeptical about John Mozeliak. You may be skeptical about the way the Cardinals do certain things in the offseason, but it's kind of hard to argue with the notion that, and this is why innings matter, right? Because cause I, some Cardinals fans say, well, why does it matter? Why are we going to you know, trump up Kyle Gibson for giving up seven runs just because he went six innings? Like, what's the big deal about that? Didn't we tell you you were going to see what the big deal was? The fact that he was able to do that on Sunday and get through six innings instead of just going two, like we saw sometimes guys like Wayno last year and, and maybe some others that that you know Drew Rom would leave starts early. And it's not to say Drew Rom still can't have a nice career. He's on the shelf right now with injury, but he's not somebody that the Cardinals are immediately going to have to call upon if they need a sixth or or even a seventh starter. There are other guys in that in that position and in those roles this year, but that's really what it's all about is getting through the innings. Because they didn't have to burn their bullpen on Sunday. Last night, you had to go extra innings. It was in a losing effort, and that sucks. It feels like it's in vain to have to burn the bullpen arms that they did. But to still be able to have enough guys fresh to do what they did tonight, that doesn't happen if Kyle Gibson doesn't get through six. That's why we talk about it, and that's why the Cardinals wanted a Kyle Gibson. I know that it can be frustrating to just say, eh, did they settle? Did they settle for these one-year contracts for 36-year-olds that, you know, what's really the upside for those players? I'm not saying I'm just stumping for everything the Cardinals do and every decision that, that they make. I think people who watch me and, and read me and listen to me believe I can be fair but can also be critical when it's necessary to be so. I look at the moves the Cardinals made and say, I do get it. I get why they went after the the particular arms that they did for that rotation to kind of stabilize the back end because a guy like Kyle Gibson doing what he did helped contribute to a win on a Tuesday even though on a Sunday he gave up seven runs. That can maybe be happy talk for some people. It doesn't sound like anything they want to hear about their baseball team when they they just want to kind of vent and be frustrated about a loss, and I get it. And last year, you guys had to deal with too many of those losses for a team that went 71 and 91. But that is a really good example in in reality and in practice of what the Cardinals kind of envisioned in the offseason when they went out and attacked their winter the way that they did. I think it's really interesting. And now you see Sonny added to the equation. Look, they've gridded through the first couple of weeks without Sonny Gray and with Zach Thompson as sort of their sixth star having to step right in and be their number five. Sonny Gray comes in and it can be a very different looking team and and wait till he's built up and maybe go in six or seven tonight instead of the five that he had to do uh, simply because of the pitch count. So it it is a breath of fresh air what he was able to do. I, I completely agree. The bullpen being night and day, Brett, from last year, I think happens in part, thanks to what the offense is doing. And they went out and got the right bullpen guys. They went out and acquired the right relievers. And I still think Keenan is going to be one of those guys if he can get healthy. I think Riley O'Brien is going to be one of those guys if he can get healthy. To think that they've had a couple of somewhat key bullpen injuries to guys that um, they they knew were going to be in the mix. And maybe you didn't know that about uh, Riley O'Brien, but they certainly hoped that he would be in the mix with the stuff they saw from him in spring. That that's happened already, and you're still looking at this bullpen going, hey, I think you got something here. That, to me, is notable. That, to me, is notable about where the Cardinals are at right now. Trevor says, when the game is postponed tomorrow, I wonder when they'll make it up. I have no idea. So I can't spend much time speculating that. Somebody said, they asked me on Twitter, May 2nd, is that? And I said, dude, I have no idea. I haven't the the, the slightest idea what that's going to be. Hopefully they play, um, but we'll see. Brett says, I know just one start, but I'm fully going to be a Sonny Gray fanboy for the next three years. Yeah, dude, he is a guy that's easy to root for and easy to like. Um, I'm going to try to post some of the audio from him post game. Uh, under the under the YouTube channel at some point, either tomorrow or you know whenever. I feel like people listen to it whenever if uh, if they're in, enjoying that kind of thing. He he's an easy guy to get behind. The more you hear him talk and the more you watch him pitch, I think fans are gonna they already love him, but they're gonna continue to to do so. Uh, Corn says hello. What's going on? Jack says Gorman has been flexing his power a lot early this season. No pull side homers, just oppo or center. Yeah, this one was left of center, man. It was. Um, 419 feet of just pure meat on that ball tonight uh, to to do what he did against Zach Wheeler, who, look, man, Zach Wheeler came into this game. I I got to say, Mia Culpa, I said on the radio this afternoon on, on KTGR on the big show in Columbia, 
I said I think the Cardinals would drop this one like three to one or something. I, I thought they wouldn't really be able to get anything done against Jack Wheeler. And uh, Zach Wheeler goes seven. He still gets through seven, but he gives up three runs. And the Cardinals were hyper efficient with what they were able to do. You get that fifth inning, couple of base knocks, and then you don't get another hit for the rest of the inning, but you score them both. That is the kind of Cardinal baseball that I think fans in this town can really appreciate. Uh, Jack, I'm glad the lag has mostly been fixed on the vid side. Appreciate that. Josh says, I'll be watching in the morning, B-Shape, but what a game. You think Lynn builds off this tomorrow night, which will be afternoon on Wednesday, and the Cardinals can take the series, and hopefully you get some good sleep soon. Yeah, hopefully I do. Uh, thanks, Josh, for enjoying everything and for uh, supporting the channel. Make sure to subscribe, too. Like, I don't know if some of you might have seen the ad a little bit ago. Uh, a lot of times when I do the live streams, I don't make the revenue that I do on the, the regular videos, but I appreciate that it gets everybody involved. So we we do these, and we want to continue to do them. Um, so, but some some people can watch tomorrow, and that's the way that uh, that's the way it should be. That everybody can watch or listen when it's appropriate. Uh, Timothy was in the house too. Great win. Yes, it certainly was, Tim. Uh, as for Lynn, yeah, look, I think it's going to come down to the weather situation. I certainly hope he doesn't have to deal with another rain delay because that was a bummer for him last Saturday. He could have gone six innings, I bet you, and uh, instead only could go four out in L.A. because of uh, because of the weather there. So that was kind of a bummer. Um, and not this past Saturday. I guess that would have been the, the Saturday before. And then the home opener was obviously, you know, what it was for giving up the home runs that he did to uh, to, to old Jake Berger. Uh, Korn says that Sonny is going to be great to have back. And I think the Cardinals, imagine when he can go a full 100 pitches. You know, he's only 65 tonight. Hyper efficient to be able to get through five the way that he did. Glad that he was able to, to get the win, too. Like, that feels good for a guy that knows going in he can only throw 65 pitches. It's pretty good. Uh, Graham says, hi, big fan. I'm a fan of you too, Graham. Corn says, how about the sick hat Sonny had? I want that post game. I saw, I think his Cardinals Gibbs, I think posted the picture. Um, I didn't know. Cause I, in the clubhouse, just a little bit of behind the scenes, we're not supposed to take pictures, but there'll be video. And obviously Bally probably had, uh, had the camera trained on him. And so that might be where that, that screen grab came from. But then I saw in the comments that there's a website selling that hat, I think for 60 bucks. I clicked on it. I said, over, under, what's what's going to be the over, under on the price on this hat? Um, but, you know, it's probably still worthwhile. Pretty cool hat for sure. Uh, Peter wants to know, is Sonny Gray on a pitch count for the next start against Oakland on athletics? Which, be careful, the A's have been playing some good ball. I don't know if that's true. I just saw a few highlights and was like, oh, they're playing some good ball. Uh, 42 likes. It's Jackie Robinson. We can get it up to, to Bob Gibson 45, can't we? Certainly. And then I think we'll target Willie. We'll target Willie 51 after that. Get those likes in on this video, folks. Um, the answer to that, Peter, is probably, I don't know what the number's going to be, but if I had to guess, you're thinking 80, 80-ish, maybe 85, depending, for Sonny Gray against uh, against the A's in the next one. But yeah, they're not going to just just take the training wheels off completely. They're going to they're gonna be smart with this. Sonny Gray cares so much about managing arm care and doing recovery and making sure he's on top of those things. Um, but that being said, they're not going to just jump in from 65 to... Uh, to full go. So yeah, there will be a number, Peter. I just don't know offhand what it's going to be just yet. Here's a great question that's very relevant from Brett. Does Zach Thompson stay in the bullpen or go to AAA to stay on an every five-day schedule? I thought I saw him warming up today, but I don't trust the memory. You're right, Brett. He was warming. He would have had the very next batter if you didn't get the Johan Rojas double play that, that Sonny was able to induce there to end the fifth inning. He was going to get the next batter. That was the last batter darn near the last pitch that Sonny was going to be allowed to throw. And uh, so it would have been Zach Thompson thereafter. Once he got through five, then it's like, okay, you really don't need him in this context. Maybe he can throw behind Lance Lynn if you get a big lead on on Wednesday or if you fall behind. Or maybe, honestly, could be useful to have him just in case of a rain delay, right? What if they have a rain delay? And I haven't looked at the forecast, but they're talking about it. But what if you have a rain delay in the third or fourth inning again, and then it's a long, long layover, and then you go back out there? That could be Zach Thompson getting you through maybe innings four, five, and six, or something like that. After that, they got the off day Thursday, and then you can decide roster move-wise what the play is going to be there, and I do not know what the Cardinals are going to do. I really don't. It's hard to have a, a Zach Thompson in, in your bullpen and just say, yeah, we'll keep him stretched out by not knowing when he can pitch or how many innings, but you also need to have that six starter available, somebody that you trust in case there is another injury to your rotation. So that's a tough spot. I'm not. I do not envy the Cardinals for the situation that they're in with Thompson. Um, and then there's a side of it where he's not been throwing his velo right. Like he was 90, 91, and then down to 87, 88 in the last inning of his previous outing. So what's going on with him mechanically? Is that something that you want to continue to work on at the major league level? 
not being able to know when you're going to go out there and pitch. Not an ideal situation. Um, Zach's been a guy who's been kind of yanked around a little bit by circumstances the last couple of years. So like I said, I don't envy the situation the Cardinals are in there. Um, Aaron says pre-scheduled off day for Walker or day off to work on things. Yeah, scheduled off day, I'm sure. They got to get some of these guys out. Like Victor's played every game. He shouldn't play Wednesday. Uh, Goldie, you might give a day off his feet as well, especially if Wilson would be able to catch, which I don't think he's going to be quite ready to do. Um, said he still had some pain swinging a bat pregame, but they, he said, you're not going to take me out of this lineup. So he was in there. Um, but yeah, you know, maybe you have Burleson play first base tomorrow, uh, something like that. I, they got to kind of cycle these guys through. We'll see if Brandon Crawford ends up playing for win. That's something else that they, that they want to look at. My preference would be to let win go out there and play again while he's kind of riding hot defensively and offensively too. I think I'd like to see him back in there. I get it. You want to manage him for the long season, but when they have an off day Thursday, anyway, I kind of feel like. I don't know. I get it's a day game after a night game, but how much you can only protect so many different guys in your lineup and, and they're making it a point to protect win. They haven't really done it with Victor. Um, to me, it's Michael Ciani in center. That's what I would do Wednesday. And I would put Burleson at first um, as well, but for Walker. Yeah, he's going to, he's going to get days off just like anybody. And um, you know, sometimes when a guy's not really going hot at the plate, I, I do think it could make sense to just say, Hey, that's your day to just kind of, kind of reset mentally and, and refocus yourself. And, and maybe that was a little bit of it for, uh, for Jordan tonight, for sure. Okay, trying to scroll through the chat. YouTube kind of uh, sent me on the fritz, unfortunately. So I got to find where the heck we were. Uh, Graham still asking about Jordan. Um, how has he looked this season? Big disappointment on my fantasy team. Yeah, he hasn't looked super duper comfortable, and you haven't seen the power. Same thing with Nolan Arenado um, and Goldie as well in, in recent days. It's a work in progress, but you're a dozen games into the season, so I wouldn't press the panic button for fantasy or anything like that. Um, I would pick up Avon Herrera if he's available in your league. I think he could be a guy that, especially when it's hard to find catching, he's going to play more than people think. And I said that back in spring. That was before I knew that that Wilson would get hit on the back of the hand in the first week of the season. But he's going to get opportunities because he can mash. And the Cardinals are just going to have to accept at some point when when Newt comes up, probably Friday, if I had to guess, based on just the scheduling of things. Like, if it's not going to be tomorrow, Wednesday, why wouldn't it, you know, Thursday, there's no game. So, I'm looking at it and going, well, it's a day game after a night game. Probably not going to get nude up after after playing tonight in uh, in Springfield, I think it was. So, anyway, I'm thinking Pajes might end up being the guy to go when Newt comes back up. And you keep Siani as a guy who can be a late-inning defensive sub. You keep Victor as your center fielder who's playing Sterling defense and Newt then to left. And then you got to figure out some playing time for Burley. But I think, again, he can... He can sub at first on days that that Goldie DHs, perhaps when Wilson's back to being able to catch, and you find some playing time for guys. But um, you know, it, it's certainly a spot right now for this offense. I kind of forget what the question was. Honestly, was talking in circles there for a little bit. But um, whether it's Jordan, whether it's some of these other guys, the the, the offense is going to come around. I, I think is the is the bottom line on on some of that stuff. Um. Do, 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 do. Michael says, I thought this was the best game of the year so far. Ollie pushed all the right buttons. Gray was good as advertised, and the offense did just enough. Fun game. It was a fun game. You'd like to see the offense be a little more robust. Who wouldn't? But at the same time, I think you can live with what you got when the pitching is as good as it was. Uh, it's all about kind of syncing up those games where your pitching is lights out, so you don't need as much offense, but then the offense sort of recognizing and picking up the mantle on the days where you do. You Maybe your starter gives up four, and you have to try and match that. That's where a team can really get into into sync and, and to start vibing. We haven't seen that entirely yet from the Cardinals, but certainly uh, you got enough of it today. And, and two on Ollie, people are going to like Ollie Marmel. This Cardinals team wins. If they win, they're going to like Ollie Marmel. I'm I'm going to be I'm going to have a big s eaten grin on my face about it if Cardinal Nation comes around on Ollie because he's a good dude, a good manager, and I agree. He pushed the right buttons tonight in circumstances that weren't entirely obvious about what he should or should not have done. I thought he handled it really well. Like, you let Jojo Romero go to 34 pitches. That's unusual for a guy who's, you know, not really built up to necessarily carry that workload, but they, he knew that they had to do it, and he knew that he had the guy on the mound that he could trust to do it. Those things don't always get noticed, but I think Cardinals fans are... I've seen multiple Cardinals fans go, you know what, I'm maybe not... I'm not always the hugest Ollie fan, but I thought he did a nice job tonight. I thought he did, too. I thought he had a really good game as a manager. Uh, Michael also says Jojo was superb. Love the emotion. Yeah, why wouldn't you? Peter wants to send down Walker to call up Gomez. Gomez is not Moises Gomez is not on the forty man. Defensively, he's he's probably even maybe a little less adept than Jordan Walker in the outfield. Um, Jordan overcorrecting his issues, overthink his swing, and cause more issues. 
I think we got to lay off Jordan Walker a little bit. He's 21 years old. He's going to come around. I think Jordan Walker is going to be okay. Uh, sending him down is not the answer to me personally. And Gomez is not on the 40, so he wouldn't be a guy that comes up anyway. Uh, Brett wants to know who they send down for new bar. I think Pajes is probably the answer. I hate to normally do that. I don't like to speculate that, but I think it's a matter of if it's Friday for Newt, that gives him a few more days to get Wilson ready. And I, and I think Pajes, I'd love to see him get into the game. Maybe Wednesday. I don't know if that'll happen. I'd like to see it. Um, I think he's a good player too. I think Cardinal fans are going to like him when they get more chances to see, uh, what Pedro Pajes is all about. But I also look at it and say, you don't really necessarily need that third catcher. I think they could get more utility out of, like keeping Michael Ciani to be able to have him field right field for Jordan if you're in the eighth inning of a game that you're ahead. Tonight he did for Burleson. He came in as a as a pinch runner, actually. And so that's just like the stuff that I like the build of the bench when you can do something like that. When you can say, look, is it like so necessary when there's a, it was Herrera on second, but you had Burleson that gets on base. I think he drew a walk, and so he's on first. He's not even the lead runner, but you're going to bring in Ciani for defense anyway because you have a three-run lead and you're trying to maximize that moment, bring him in for a pinch runner too. It's kind of like a two birds, one stone situation. Siani is a valuable guy to have off the bench in that role. I didn't know that I would feel that way. If you would have told me that back in you know February coming into spring, I, I've really grown to appreciate what he's bringing for this Cardinals team as well. Um, look, it doesn't always have to be thunder offensively. I think he plays a an important role for a team that wants to prioritize quality base running, quality defense. Michael Siani is bringing those things to the table. Like he's He's a major league caliber guy in that regard. Uh, Timothy says that when Helsley mixes it up, he's damn near unhittable. It reminds me of of Jordan Hicks when it was like, yes, he throws 105. But he, and now he doesn't, by the way. He's kind of dialing back the velo a bit and having some success, uh, some success, pardon me, with uh, with San Francisco. But it reminded me where I would always look at, at Jordan Hicks and go, his best pitch is his slider. Like, it's his best pitch. When Helsley mixes in some of the other pitches, it's not fair. And tonight was one of those nights where you just looked at it and you go, it's not fair. There's nothing any of those hitters can do to this guy. 14 pitches, 11 strikes, didn't stand a chance. A couple of Ks. Dealing the cards asks, uh, when Nuke comes back, how do they find more time for Herrera? I think it kind of becomes almost a pseudo platoon for that like occasional spot between Burley and Herrera, if that makes sense. And it's going to depend on who's on the mound, probably. Um, that's kind of the way that I look at it. It's going to be tough, but... You know, I, I think it's a good problem to have as well because Lars Newpar, like before the injury, you come into the season, he would have been one of the most important guys to me on this team because I think he's going to bat third, at least if they continue to bat Goldie and Arenado where they are in the lineup. I think he's the lefty that that maybe breaks that up and then Gorman goes down to maybe five or six if Wilson's at five. And suddenly the lineup just looks a heck of a lot longer. And I know right now it doesn't look long at all because the guys who are supposed to be your studs aren't hitting but I, I kind of look at that, and I get it. Herrera is a guy that needs to get in there. Um, you know, it's going to be a fair question. Dealing, it's a fair question, my friends. It, it, they're going to find it, though. They're going to find a way to make it happen if Herrera continues to hit. Um, but they need they need the spark that Newt can bring. I think he can be a lineup changer if he gets right. 500 with Golden Auto looking as bad as they have is pretty good in my book. Corn, I agree, man. If those guys start hitting, you suddenly, it, it, and the key is, though, keep the other stuff the same. Keep the rotation dealing the way that it is right now. Keep the bullpen doing what it's done. The rotation, I think, has to come first. It's like the chicken or the egg. But you got to keep the rotation fresh so that the bullpen can stay um, fresh as well. Or keep the rotation going deep and, and efficient so that the bullpen uh, can be fresh enough to do what it can do. Herrera has Brett excited for the Cardinals' future behind the plate. Agree with that. Um, yeah, I think, again, I've talked in some negative terms at times where, like, if this season goes the wrong way on the Cardinals, you could end up seeing a deal where next year maybe Herrera's catching a lot more and, and maybe Goldie doesn't re-sign and you play Wilson some at first, some DH and some catcher. Um, that's something that you could certainly see if the Cardinals don't retain Goldschmidt, which hopefully he he kicks it up and ends up being great and they want to keep him for a few more years, but we got to wait that out. How many games a year do I get to check out? Yeah, Brian, it's uh, I mentioned that earlier, but it's about 50, uh, 50 to 55 to 60 at home, just depending on the circumstances of the season. Um, Caleb says, hey, B-Shape, what's going on? Verdict is still out and shaky on what Victor will be able to do at the plate. I think it's safe to say that Wynn is not a slap hitter. He'll swing it well at this level. Fun to watch. Yeah, man, uh, you know, he he got the 100 and whatever batting average that he had last year late in the season. That's not who he's going to be. He's going to come up to a new level. He's going to get acclimated, and then he's going to go. And right now we're seeing Mason Wynn take some good at-bats. Um, seat nerds got me $30 seats for two rows from the green seats tonight for Brett. Yep. There were some good seats to be had if you wanted them, and tomorrow's going to be the same thing. 
It's a shame, though, Monday, man, that is going to go down as the best weather night of the year at Bush Stadium, in my opinion. If you weren't at that one, I know it ended up being a loss, but just from like a hanging out vibes perspective, it was awesome at the ballpark. Brandon says, any thoughts on Sonny's comments that he told Ollie to not let him do anything stupid before the fifth? That's just a guy who you don't have any pretense with Sonny Gray. You don't have to wonder, like, uh, how do I how do I manage this guy in, in conversation? How do I say this thing? I don't want to make his feelings. The dude's got no pretense. He says, coach, manager, Ollie, don't let me do something stupid here by trying to talk you into, you know, we get into this inning and I'm deeper on my pitch count. Don't, don't come out there and let me try to talk you into something. Let's get on the same page. That's a guy with just unbelievable self-awareness in Sonny Gray to say, look, I know that once I get out there, if it's in a spot where it's just like having the awareness to, to tell the guy, look, I'm going to want to do something that could be a little bit damaging to this team and to myself if I get into a spot where I think I need to pitch us through it. You're going to have to tell me no. That I, Cardinals fans, we've talked about it, but they don't even understand the self-awareness of his own body, of his own game, of his own personhood that Sonny Gray has, it is unique. I don't think you see this every day in Major League Baseball. You don't see this every day in all walks of life. Sonny Gray is a special, special guy that the Cardinals are lucky to have, and I think that's something that demonstrates it. Not just talking about his ability to pitch out there, not just talking about how he carries a a baseball in every postgame interview because he's always got one because that's the way he is wired, but it's the other stuff too, man. That is a great example, Brandon, of him telling Ollie, don't let me do something stupid here. And just the the communicative aspect of that is very, very unique. And like I said, there's no pretense with this guy. He's going to tell you what he thinks needs to be told, and that's going to make communicating with him even easier on the other side because you know that that could be a two-way street. He's going to be, look, you can give him some some feedback, and like anybody, he might take it a certain way and go, well, I didn't really like the way I was told that. But he is introspective, and he's going to think, okay, I understand where that person's coming from. He's very, I mean, just a really top-notch individual. In, in the experience that I've had watching him and, and just interviewing him in, in groups and stuff like that. Um, concern level for the offense on a scale of one to 10. That's Michael's next question. I'm going to say how concerned would it be? Like a 10 would be like sound the alarm bells. I like kind of doing the DEF CON system. DEF CON one is the bad DEF CON and five is like everything's chill. Um, and, and like on DEF CON, I was I, I'm around like a three because I do think that there's going to be some lingering maybe aspect of this when it comes to um, and hopefully the stream doesn't end here. I'm, I'm having a little bit of a, there we go, getting it back. Uh, you know, like, I don't know if Arnado is going to be the same guy. I don't know if Goldschmidt's going to be the same guy as, as those guys have been prior in their career. Maybe that's an overreaction to just a couple of weeks, but it's not really just a couple of weeks for Arnado because we saw Dayton back to August 19th of last year. He hasn't hit a home run since. And he had his first walk of the season tonight. He's going through it. Does it mean he's just a bad hitter now? No, I don't think that's necessarily it. But is he going to return to MVP candidate Nolan? I don't know. I really don't. This is a prolonged stretch. This is like 25% of a Major League Baseball season. If you go from, you know, mid-August, count it to the end of the year, and then come here to now. Now, granted, he was injured for the last part of September, so that's maybe not an entirely fair characterization. But from a a plate appearances standpoint, it's been like 160-some-odd plate appearances since his last big league homer. So that is basically a quarter of a season. So from that perspective, yeah, I I do think it's a little bit notable and there is a concern level there. But offense as a whole, like, no, I don't think Nolan's a 570 OPS guy. I don't think Goldie's a 570 OPS guy. So if those guys are at least in the 700s, which I think both of them will be at least that and and should both hopefully push for 800 plus, that would say that I'm not as concerned. So I would say my concern level is about a four if if 10 is, is real, real bad. Three and a half to four. And I tell you what, the moment we see Goldie have a three for five or Nolan have a three for five and hit a home run, it probably drops even lower because I just got to see it once. And then I go, okay, there it is again. But I mean, if, if I mean, Arnauto, as you look at his exit velocities and his recent at-bats, he had a, a good double yesterday, though, early in the game. But since then, it's been multiple strikeouts and basically everything pounded into the infield at, at 60 exit below for the most part. So it's been a little bit concerning. There's no doubt. Brian's high on the pen. Looking really solid. I agree. Blake, what's going on, brother? Think we could get a... <laughs> I'm not going there. I'm not touching that, Blake. I'm not touching that. If, you, if you're listening on Spotify or on YouTube the next day, you'll have to hunt down Blake's comment and and um, and you'll be able to know why I maybe got a bit of a chuckle. Um, BS, can't wait for O'Brien to come back. Think he'll be a really good addition for a few years, hopefully. Yep, that would be helpful if he can get healthy. You hate the flex or tendon stuff, but there's, there's no way to know like when a guy's going to be back. But it'd be nice. 
Side note, as of today, who's the biggest threat in the Central? Pirates legit? I think the Pirates could be legit. Yeah, I really think it's possible that they could be legit because I think when they get Paul Skeens, it's their own doing that he's not up yet, but I think he's going to be a you know a, a mid to top end of the rotation guy almost immediately. That's maybe high praise, but if you see what he's doing in AAA, he's just he doesn't belong there. He's a, he's a special pitcher, and they, and I like that Jerry Jones that they've got. I I think uh, I haven't looked to see what Mitch Keller was up to so far this year, but he really finally had that breakout last year. Like you get pitching man and 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 have some young position players that step forward. I like that Cabrian Hayes. Um, yeah, not a great start for Keller so far, but look, I think the Pirates can win eighty something games. You got to keep in mind they won seventy six last year, if I'm not mistaken. You know the, the Cardinals were last in the division. Pirates weren't, and um, they outplayed the Cardinals last year. So who's to say that they can't get a little better with an O'Neill Cruz stepping forward and some different guys? Um, Brian Reynolds is a really good player. So. Henry Davis is coming along as a, as a young guy they brought up. So I think the Pirates are legit enough to be in that soft, cushy middle. Right now, the Central is like the best division in baseball. The Cardinals are in last place as a 6-6 six and six team. I don't think the Brewers are necessarily going to have the staying power because I get the sense that they'll be looking for a reason to sell at the deadline. But they like they could still win 78, 79 games on accident. They got good players. Um, and then they get Devin Williams back in the second half, perhaps. That's going to make them even better. I look at the Reds and I think they are scary if their young pitching can get it get it strung together with a with a good starting five because the, the position players that they have, if they're healthy, like Ellie Dale Cruz is going to be kind of a, a hit and miss guy, but he's going to hit a lot. And when he does, it's going to be loud. And um he can make a lot of really good plays. So they've got some exciting young players. The Cubs, I think, are going to be, you know, in that mix to win eighty to eighty five games. It's all going to be about what teams do at the deadline, too, though. Like as of today, I still think I would lean Cardinals. But there is an element of like, what if the Pittsburgh Pirates just don't look back? You know, what if some of these teams just take off and don't look back? And it's not an 85 win team winning the Central like we thought it would be. If it's a 90 to 95 win team, and there ain't and there ain't nothing you can do about it. That would be my wife will hate me for that grammar there, but that's you know that's possible. Libby out of the pen could be a huge weapon. Corn, I agree. He just has to get the uh, get the command a little bit better than it was tonight. Scared for a second there, getting Harper to roll into the double play after looking shaky was clutch. That was clutch. Burley getting some of those hits to fall is big for him. Yeah, it's about time he gets the the BABIP, the batting average on balls in play, to, to move his way a little bit. BS is asking for an update on Edmund. The update, uh, as of earlier this week, is that he's swinging uh, off the tee from both sides, which is the key. I think earlier he was only doing one side. They kept having to shut him down. I believe he's been cleared to swing from both sides, which hopefully means a couple weeks he can start getting into some rehab games. But he's kind of starting from scratch at, at, at a spring training level. So it could still be a, a minute before you see him. Uh, Brian says that win is my big surprise of the year so far. Bats looking better than last year. Yeah, he's looked really comfortable at the plate. I think Victor looks comfortable a lot of the time too, Tim. It's just been, uh, you know, some of those games where he's bunting. It's not that I don't love the bunt. It's not like I'm anti whitey ball. I just think that to demonstrate that he's good and feeling confident at the plate, I don't think it's a good look to be doing it every time. Um, Corn is ripping packs on MLB The Show. I don't have the game. I need to I need to get the game, but I don't have a PS5. It's a whole thing. I would one v one you if I had the game. I swear to you, I would be doing so kinds of crazy stuff on the show if I had a PS5. But um, you know, we'll get some super chats later this year, and we'll we'll get that we'll get that done. Brendan says I'm so down for some live streams during games. That's good to see. Who comes back when? Uh, who gets sent down when Keenan or Riley come back? I would say Garrett that uh, Middleton and Riley O'Brien are not close enough for that question to be all too relevant just yet. It's going to be a while. They haven't even started rehabs or anything like that. Um, Deal in the cards wants me to stop holding Moe's water. I will work on that. I'll definitely work on that. Mike, what's up, my friend? So many things to be happy about tonight. It feels great to see the Cardinals compete like winners again. They really were competitive tonight, weren't they? Just a really nice competitive all-around game by this team. Austin hopped on the stream. What's up? What's the aversion to batting Goldie and Arenado back-to-back? Keep experimenting with the three-hole, Contreras, Nolan, Newt. Who do you think should hit third? Um, I don't think it's an aversion. They did it the other day when it was uh, the, the the scratch from the lineup for Contreras. I don't think they're unwilling to do it. Um, I think that if you don't do it, you just start to look at the way the rest of the lineup shakes out, and it does unbalance itself pretty quickly, and that'll be especially the case when Newt Park comes back because you don't want to bat your lefties back-to-back. It becomes susceptible to a loogie that, in the modern era, the left-handed only guy um, is not really a thing anymore because of the three batter minimum, but it makes it easier to have that be a thing if you stack them uh, against each other in your lineup. They already have the nine and the one be both lefties with Victor and uh, Brendan Donovan, so that's where a place where the lineup does turn over for left-handed uh, batters. 
I kind of feel like I like Newt Bar there a little bit, but I also, if Goldie and Arenado aren't hitting, I'm willing to change anything and, and kind of mix it up a little bit. The other part, though, is Arenado is a little, I'm not going to say temperamental, but I think he's preferential and he wants to bat fourth. He wants to bat cleanup. The other part of that is, are you cleaning up when it's your turn to clean up? Or, you know, can you dictate your spot in the lineup if you're not performing? Those sorts of questions I, I understand fans are going to have. Um, but I would li- I don't mind the left, right, left, right to begin. Um, and I think let it let it look like what it looks like. If Newt Bar's batting third, let that kind of play out a little bit and see what it looks like. If you would go, I personally might go Gorman fifth and, and Wilson sixth, but either direction you 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 frame that. Um, the other one's gonna you know Walker's gonna be seventh. Like if these guys who are on paper that you really like end up pitching the way they're or pitching hitting the way that they're supposed to, I think this lineup can be robust. Um, and man, Mason Wynn, like you said, he's he's hitting the ball really well, taking good at bats, and he's your eight-hole guy. So, um, you know, there's a lot to like about what they're doing right now, um, or or rather what they could be doing if you get Newt back and the guys who are supposed to hit start hitting. Um, there's a lot to like about what what Mason's doing um, and, you know, Yvonne Herrera is doing, but outside of that, there's been a little bit lean. Um, but we haven't seen Wilson for a number of days until tonight either, so that's another guy who's who's had a nice start. Cairo and Mizzou 1755 are both uh, singing the praises of JoJo, which is absolutely right. We've done a lot of that tonight. Make sure if you miss any part of the stream, you can you can watch back tomorrow for sure. Allison's late to the party. Thanks for the insight. Missed the first five innings due to a board meeting. Um, thanks for breaking it down. Yeah, shoot. The, the the five innings you wanted to see were probably Sonny's, but I tell you what, Allison, he was good. He looked real good. CJ, what's going on, man? Pitching was awesome tonight. Um, still need to get Newt back. Vic is not quite ready yet offensively. I could see that, but man, he's bringing the heat in the field and, and certainly on the bases. I wanted to see him get that third stolen base tonight after he uh, he beat out the the would be double play, but then it was the wild pitch that ended up catching um, catching GT. I keep calling him GT. JT Real Muto, um, kind of under the neck there, which was very very uncomfortable. I hope he's okay. Corn is liking Kittredge so far. Uh, yeah, Ebbets is who sells the Bob Gibson hat. Good call on that by Eric. And I see Grave of Einstein has hopped in. I'm trying to get through all these comments as best as I can, but I'm already over the hour prescription. Let me take a quick drink and might be able to, to rock and roll here. Brandon couldn't watch, but what he saw, pitching was great. Sonny able to shut him down in the debut at home. Against that Phillies lineup, no less. Bullpen hasn't been bad. No, it hasn't been. I would go as far as to say the bullpen's been really good. Uh, Caleb wants to know if I think Crawford is a good pickup. I don't know. I always thought Edmund at short, Donovan Gorman at second was a pretty good infield. Um, no, I, I think it's I think Edmund in center is the right decision if you're not going to have it be Victor Scott. I think that's why they got Crawford was to not have Edmund be the shortstop. And and you have Mason Wynn now at short. So you certainly don't need Edmund there on a daily basis at short. And it's important to have a great defensive center fielder. And Edmund's arm might not be great in center, but you know what is great? His instincts and his range. And so that's why they signed Crawford was so that he didn't have to yank Edmund around for the, you know, the umpteenth year in a row. And I think that is right. Whether Crawford was the way that that needed to come to fruition, that can be left up for debate. I think he's a harmless guy to have around because he's obviously experienced, but there's also, you know, the range is not so strong at this point. Offensively, anything you get, I guess, kind of feels like a bonus, but the Cardinals felt most comfortable going with a proven option even if that means, like, could you have gone uh, Thomas to JC and said, hey, you're not going to play every day, but you're a big league guy, we think, and we're going to have you play some shortstop. You could have, but that's not the way they really operate. They want to get him at bats to where if he is that kind of prospect type of hitter, he comes up, and when he comes up, he ends up being a guy that plays every day. That could be an option for the Cardinals for sure. Uh, we're at 50 likes. I want to get to Willie McGee. Let's get to 51 for sure uh, on this video if you click like and click subscribe too. Mason Wynn climbing the ranks as Corn's favorite player every day. He is so fun to watch. He has been a, a delight, not only offensively, but uh, but in the field. He can run the bases, too. He certainly can run the bases. Brandon's glad that they were finally able to beat Wheeler. And John says another homer for Gorman. Let's hope it continues. Yeah, they need more home runs. It's nine on the season. They're still toward the bottom of the barrel, though, in, in the league. So got to get it to happen. Cardinals haven't been batting to the score yet. Yeah, Mike, that's a good point. ETA for most of the pitching prospects is 2024, according to Peter. Talking about Hence, Roby, et cetera, do you think we'll see him in the bigs this year? I think the way that I would frame that, and I don't think that it is quite 2024. That might be pushing it for both Hens and Roby. But I do think those guys are two of the top upside prospects uh, pitching-wise in the org. I think that you need to get them to a point where 
they could conceivably be called up, but hopefully they're not needed until next year. And then you kind of look at going into spring and say, okay, how did the Lynn Gibson thing pan out? Do you want either or both of them back? Or do you maybe have them walk? You bring in another free agent to fill one of the spots, but the other one is kind of an open competition between Hens and Roby and Thompson and, and Graceffo and McGreevy. And like, maybe that is a way that that could play out for 2025. So I think for Hens Roby, I hope they show that they would be an option by the end of 2024, but that they're not necessarily required to be called upon is the way that I would frame that. Corn says that Ollie is not a bad manager. Cards fans just hate losing and need someone to blame. I think that's fair. Easiest guy to blame is the manager, but I don't think he's bad. And Corn agrees with Charlie. Ugh, Charlie Marlowe. Why are we talking about him? Just playing. Uh, you as Cardinals fans are a bit negative. Need to put last year to bed. Well, you know what could put last year to bed, though, is the Cardinals winning more games this year. I've already seen a slight uptick in positive YouTube comments already in the last couple of days, and they're still only a 500 team. So I, I think Cardinals fans are going to be willing to be positive if the team can put together a winning record. Uh, Grave did not see me go live, but I'm here. I am here. CJ thinks the bullpen has potential. And Ethan says whenever Walker wants to turn into Walmart brand Aaron Judge, that would be cool. Give Walker some time. I'm, I'm not going to panic on Walker just yet. What happens if Arenado doesn't turn around within the month, a month straight of just Cabrian Hayes? Um, yeah, I mean, is is Cabrian struggling offensively? I know he had a big spring, and I know that he is um, he's the Gold Glove winner, reigning Gold Glove winner now. So I don't I don't really understand that comment. He's been hitting pretty well, 760 OPS. I, Cardinals would would kill for that from Nolan right now. Gorman doesn't look that good defensively, according to the grave of Einstein, but he has swag over there, which is important. I think he does look good defensively. I don't agree with that. I think he's done a nice job at second. He's turned himself in. The arm is great, and I think he he looks smooth at times, um, besides the ball kicked yesterday, which was Monday. Yeah, I guess there was one that happened there. I'd have to go back and look, though. Holden says after Edmund eventually comes off the IL, what does that mean for a guy like Scott? It means he might go down to, to Memphis unless um, the offense ticks up. Is, is basically that conversation. But Edmund is still weeks away to me. Uh, you may not even see him in April. So there's still time to have Scott, if the Cardinals are so inclined, um, be able to to kind of rise himself up offensively before that decision has to be made. Brian saw that Jackson Holiday is coming up for the O's, which he is. Good to see from that. Uh, deserving, for sure. And, and now he can take his crack at Rookie of the Year and try to get the Orioles... Uh, a draft pick because I think they, they called him up in, in an early enough fashion to qualify for that. Nato had a 600 OPS last April as well, says Sammy. Then he had an OPS above 900 for three months straight until falling off hard in August, which was around the time that maybe he was dealing with an injury. Yes. And uh, maybe it still hurts. Yeah. I mean, you could think you go all the way back to the world baseball classic last year. And, and I think he got hit by the pitch uh, on, on the wrist. Was that a thing? He was been dealing with back issues for the last couple of years. I don't know if that's something that's going on for him right now, but certainly just doesn't look right. And running the bases does not look right for Nolan right now either, um, which he's not fast. He's probably one of the slowest people in Major League Baseball, but it's kind of like, is he comfortable running? You know, he looks good defensively, but everything else is a little bit suspect in just the, the optics of it, which I don't know if that means he's hurt or not. I'm sure he's playing through something because guys always seem to be, but that's just kind of my two cents there. Uh, corn grabs some trail mix looking for more diversity than six almonds in that handful. All right. Well, good luck to you, my friend Holden. Does Carlson get dealt at the deadline? Still a log jam in the outfield. I would say if everybody's healthy and, and that, that can be sustained for a little while, and then you can start pick, to pick and choose who you want to really ride with for the end of the year, you could see an outfield trade, especially if you need a, a bullpen pitcher at the time, or maybe, you know, uh, some starting depth, a, a swing man type. I could see that trade come together. But right now, it's hard to project because there's not a lot of health going on. Uh, Einstein says, wonder what Turner Ward is cooking in the lab. He is quickly becoming a Jeff Albert type scapegoat. But all this jumping on early pitches sounds like something he wants them to do. Yeah, I think he does want them to do it. I think the the complaining and scapegoating of the, the pitching coach and the hitting coach, hitting coach in particular, but even the pitching coach too, is one of the dumbest things that fan bases do. Like, you guys all wanted Jeff Albert fired, and then he got fired, or he left of his own volition. And you, you have a different hitting coach, and now it's like, okay, well, is it this guy's fault now, or is it just the same players who have not been achieving to the desired level? And it's it's like, who are the guys that you're really worried about right now? Goldie, Arenado. I, and this is maybe going to rub people the wrong way, but you don't have Turner Ward just constantly in these guys' ear going, here's what you need to do better. It's not high school ball. That's not the way it works at the big league level with veterans in particular. Same thing on the pitching side. 
Cole, uh, Cole Bartimus, our, our producer on, on Hot Take Central on Fridays, who I love, he's great, but he made the comment the other day about he thinks the sort of referendum on Dusty Blake as the pitching coach is going to be how Lance Lynn and Kyle Gibson perform, the guys the Cardinals went out and got. And I said, I really don't agree with that because I don't know how much Dusty Blake is going to have for two 36-year-olds who kind of know at this point in their major league careers how they want to go about things. It's not to say that he can't offer them some tidbits, but he's not responsible for their pitching. They've been around the block, and they're going to do what they're going to do. So that's, I think it's kind of the same thing when it comes to veteran hitters. There are things that that they those coaches can be a guiding ear, uh, a guiding voice, and, and those things can be valuable. But we also have to be realistic about what's what's you know Legion ball and high school ball, and what's the major leagues for a guy who's you know made hundreds of millions of dollars playing this game. It's just. You, you, you don't ever want to be too good to be able to listen to a to a friendly piece of advice, but at the same time, it's not like the hitting coach has is, is got a, a damn thing to do with it <laughs> sometimes. Like, to be a little bit blunt, it's not – I don't look at Turner Ward and go, yep, that's why Nolan's – no, I just – I don't think that's relevant at all. I really don't, personally. For younger players, maybe that's a little bit more of a an element where the coaches can be more of a guide, but it's, it's the big leagues, you know? So I just don't – I think we overplay that sometimes in the way we talk about it. Uh, Michael loves the old school Rams hat in the background. Yeah, um, I've got a Mizzou hat here. I've got the Rams hat. Uh, I forget which. I, I can't do mirrors when the mirror uh, video is mirrored. But anyway, yeah, that's a St. Louis Rams hat, though, by the way. It says St. Louis on the hat. It's the only reason I have it. Um, I'm all about still things that are St. Louis Rams. But after that, it's like, you know, they left. So so it is what it is. Alex, will Sonny be on a pitch count for his next start? Yeah, he will be. I don't know what it'll be, but he'll be, you know, 80, whatever that would end up being. Um, and he said, uh, BS said that I'm taking it literally meant what Hayes has been known as no bat, but great glove. Yeah, but he's starting to have a better bat. So it's not nice to, 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 to rip Cabrian Hayes. He's, he's hitting, he had a great spring and he's carrying that over a little bit in the season, but I hear you BS. I hear you. Um, Aaron likes Siani for Walker in the late innings. I agree. He says Siani goes down or Pajes. I think Pajes, if Contreras is ready by Friday to start catching. Um, you just got to be willing is if you're this team to say, look, if we've got two catchers, we're still going to play them both. And if some, if one of them gets hurt, then Pajes is, is on the next Uber <laughs> to St. Louis uh, or plane, depending on where they are. You Ubered the first time. Otherwise, you know, you just, you just got to be able to ride the rail. I think with the two catchers that you have, even though I do like Pajes a lot. Do the, do I think the Cardinals should have tried to get Montgomery back? Um, you know, no, I just, no, it's going to be my, if they were going to do it, they should have done it at the beginning of the off season. Personally though, I'm not as keen on thinking that's, that was the answer. And maybe he'll be great when he gets ramped up with the D backs, but I just think kind of like Tyler O'Neill was going to be great somewhere else. I think Montgomery is going to be great somewhere else. I don't think it would have, and I don't have like any smoking gun for that. I just don't think it would have been the right thing here. Um, because then you put yourself in a spot where you're paying five pitchers already. You want to pay a sixth, and then let's say a couple of them get hurt. Now you suddenly spooked ownership into, hey, we may need to take a step back next year because we've we've got too much dead money tied up. Like, that's not a spot. Like, clearly the Cardinals didn't want to get in that spot. And they didn't think that they were going to be able to get a guy like Montgomery for a year or two at the end of March. But that's the way it played out. But the Cardinals couldn't afford to wait for that. So if they had done it on the front end, then I think it would have been fine to sign Monty. But the fact that they didn't, they went the route that they went, and they were strategic in it. So it's incumbent upon them to let that play out. You're not going to change course when you've got, like, like Stephen Matz would have been the guy you were shoving into the bullpen. That is a terrible use of resources. If Stephen Matz is pitching well the last couple of times, and he has, and you're paying him $11 million or whatever it is, to, to voluntarily push that to the bullpen is not efficient use of resources. What the Cardinals need to do is develop a couple of pitchers so that you can have your number two or your number three or four in the rotation be a guy making 750K so that the next time there's a Montgomery in the market that pops up in March, you can take advantage. But they couldn't afford to do that this offseason. They could not afford. I don't think they did it wrong. They could not afford to go about it in a way that just said, oh, we're already paying five pitchers. We're paying the you know, the seventh most in Major League Baseball for our five-man rotation, let's throw $25 million at this guy and push one of those $11 million pitchers to the pen. That's not the way organizations are run. I know it frustrates Cardinals fans, but I see because of where they were when that decision had to be made in late March, 
And and the other side is, oh, you, you think they should have signed Montgomery to a four-year, $100 million deal? The market didn't. So that would have, in retrospect, have been probably a miss, you know, a misstep if, if the Cardinals were willing to do that at the front end. And then we'll see. If he ends up being healthy for four years, then maybe they should have. But at this point, I'm not, I'm all right with it. I want to watch the way that they put this offseason together. I want to watch it play out. You know, I think there's something to that. I'm going to wrap things up here shortly. Chan, the man wants to know about Matt Zoller's commitment. Yeah, man, I, let me know this too. You're all Cardinals fans, but if I did some Mizzou content on this page, let, I want to ask the people who aren't Mizzou fans. For the ones who are fans, like, great, you'd, you'd tune in. For the ones who aren't, would you just be able to ignore it and not unfollow me on YouTube? Because I would love to be able to do some other stuff, some general MLB, some, you know, but I've kind of kept it focused on Cardinals because I don't want to piss people off. But that's, let me know that. You can always send me a DM on, on Twitter if you have opinions about stuff like that because I want to, I'm, I'm developing this channel still. We're still in the infancy stages, just a year in. Uh, Corn says that Nato took a walk today. Yeah, his first of the season, believe it or not, which I think you knew that, which is why you commented it. I think no Newton center during rehab games I mean they don't want to send Victor down just yet. Yep, I think I think Newt's going to play left. I really do. And then you won't get Victor sent until Edmund comes back. Um, and Michael was asking who gets sent down for Newt. I think it'll be probably Pajes, maybe Siani. Those are, I mean, the or, or there will be an injury. If there's somebody injured, then that'll change the dynamic uh, for sure. But then with with Edmund, it's not soon, and neither is Dylan. So there's just time to. It's kind of like in in February when. Uh, Mo, which was a little bit funny. Jeff Jones was asking about Burleson and saying there's not really a spot for him. How does that pan out? He said, well, it's almost nonsensical to ask it right now because stuff could happen. And stuff did end up happening, and Burleys was an obvious guy to make the team when the time came. Better defensive center fielder from Blake, Bader or Victor? Uh, give me give me Victor in two years because I think the, the speed and upside makes it to where nobody can touch him. Um, Victor right now, when you watch him, kind of he's like eager to get to a ball, and so it doesn't look as smooth as Bader made it look. But the athleticism and the raw materials that Victor has to work with is going to turn him into a, a center fielder that I think uh, can certainly be better than than Bader. He's just not as polished yet as we we saw Bader to be with the Cardinals. Sammy says, I haven't really understood why people think the Central is so bad. Reds, Cubs, Pirates, Cardinals all have a strong foundation of young players. In Milwaukee, could be something, too. They're stronger than folks think. Yeah, it's the best division in baseball right now, so... There you go. Uh, yeah, Alex asks about Burleson. His bat's finally coming live. Yeah, it is. And the Car- this is what the Cardinals have expected to see for a long time with Alec Burleson. And it's why they gave him a lot of opportunities last year. I know folks were frustrated by that. But he was having some bad luck, man. He's hitting the ball hard and still kind of has. But this week, we've seen balls kind of fall in for him in a way that's going to reflect a little bit better on the batting average, a little better on the OPS. He's a good. He's a major league hitter. He's a pro hitter. Um, defensively, what's he going to be in the outfield? Had the outfield assist earlier um, in, in in the week. He's at a 556 OPS now. He's getting the batting average up after a two for two, uh, reaching base via walk. I think he's a solid player and and certainly a, a guy that can be valuable to have the next five years or so um, as as he you know works toward free agency. Even if he's not an everyday player, I think he's a valuable guy for this Cardinal team. Blake would unfollow if I talked to Mizzou. Yeah, whatever. Go find a head coach, Blake. He's a Kentucky fan. Anyway, all right, boys uh, and girls. All I'm saying, Lynn outduels Nola in the rubber match. I'm feeling good about myself. Yeah, I would too, Einstein, if that happens. And why do I think all these players are great everywhere else? Too many examples to just be random. Michael, you ask a good question. It's one that it's hard to tackle right now. I think change of scenery is a real thing, but it is fair to ask why is it always the Cardinals having the scenery that needs to be changed for these players to go be great elsewhere? It's fair to ask. I'm I'm at an hour 20 right now, so I am going to wrap it up. But ask me about it another time at the early portion of a pod, and we'll try to get into it because I do think it's it's relevant. Brian says people are hard on the coaches, but I think the org does have a problem with their pitching development, trading away solid players, Gallon and Alcantara, and poor pitcher development of late. Yeah, I mean, there's some criticism to be had there, but I want to mention a, a, a bright spot before I go. The trade where the Cardinals, the style of trade where they send a bench player for a relief pitcher has been really profitable. Uh, Edmundo Sosa was who they gave up to get Jojo Romero. Win. Uh, Luke Voigt trade. I think that was the Geo trade, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Chase and Shreve, I think, was in that deal too. But Geo is still here. Uh, unequivocally a win in the deal with the Yankees. Uh, and the other one that I was able to, to come up with earlier tonight, oh, Palacios for Kittredge, I think is going to go down as a win. So it's interesting. Yeah, if you can ignore the non-Cardinal stuff, 
And like, maybe you're not an MLB The Show person, but if I'm going to be talking Cardinals during some MLB The Show stuff, if I eventually get a PS5 and stream that, maybe that's something that you could just, hey, if you don't love it, you don't love it. And, and maybe you just don't unfollow or give it a down vote or anything like that. Uh, understand that I'm trying to give y'all content and, and I appreciate the support. I couldn't do it without you. But at the same time, if I can do some other stuff, it could maybe help me too. Because this channel is monetized on YouTube to where if I want to talk about something else, I don't have to start a new channel to do it. That sort of thing. Um, all right. That's that's where I'm going to leave you guys. I appreciate you guys as always so much to be able to uh, watch and listen and, and do these podcasts. Uh, make sure to hit like on the video before you get out of here. Hit subscribe on the channel for sure. Um, and that's going to do it for this edition of B-Shape Daily Live. I appreciate you guys so much for listening. And we will talk to you next time on the pod. Peace.